<clears throat> given everything we've said, it should be quite clear that what, what we mean by learning, right, is really about the transformation of these representations, how our belief structures change over time. So another way to say learning is just belief transformation. Why? Because learning is defi defined as changes in beliefs or behavior. Behavior is a downstream consequence of beliefs through experience. That's the classic definition, right? It's also the one that we saw in Linda Argoti's book. So how these representations actually get transformed is core to everything we do in terms of modeling learning. So what I want to show you is some fairly robust empirical signatures of how humans learn. This is useful for us because we are trying to build models that replicate what people do rather than models that necessarily optimally solve a reinforcement learning task. Okay, so to go back to the computer science framework that I showed you earlier, our focus is really on bullet point number three, the temporal differencing approach, because we know this is what comes closest to what humans do. Humans don't do dynamic programming. We're not born with the capacity. And we certainly don't get the opportunities because the task environment does not allow offline learning to, to employ Monte Carlo methods. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So you can think about play that children do. Playing is a kind of Monte Carlo method. It's a simulated version of the real world where with relatively low consequences, you can sample all the possibilities. Okay, So play can be really thought of as a form of solving the reinforcement learning task, but using a Monte Carlo method. More often, we have to learn through our actions. And that's therefore temporal differencing. That's the most powerful technique that the CS guys have evolved. And it also turns out to be very close to what humans themselves do. So I want to talk a little bit about the psychology of human learning, what properties are known to be pretty robust with strong empirical evidence, which we then want to build into our models. Again, why? Because we're not building models of what the optimal thing to do is. We are actually building models that try to replicate what actual people do. Right? We're trying to build behaviorally plausible models to give it the modern buzzword. All right, so let's start here. This is Thorndike. So Thorndike's famous experiments on cats is really at the core of reinforcement learning ideas in psychology. And uh, if you haven't heard the story before, right, this is a really uh, simple but interesting insight that he had built this box where you put a cat inside the box and the cat has to pull a string in a particular direction. And if it does, then the box opens, it can get food. And it's not so simple to figure out exactly how to pull the string. And people who used to come into his office would see this cat kind of pull the string immediately and get out and go eat the food. And they say, wow, that's a really smart cat. And then Thorndike would say, you weren't here the first 999 times. Right? So the point is, it's not so easy to get it in one shot. But through repeated trial and error learning, even a fairly simple brain like a cat can figure out a somewhat complicated puzzle. Why? Because essentially there's trial and error learning going on. It's trying different things. It's getting positive feedback sometimes, no feedback or negative feedback on other occasions. And that can aggregate up to creating a very sophisticated looking behavior, right? That's what learning is all about. So this is captured in the idea of Thorndike's law of effect. So if you see psychologists talk about law of effect, this is what they're talking about. The idea is very simple. Responses or actions that produce a positive effect are more likely to be taken again. So you do stuff and if the outcome is good, you do it again. If you do stuff and the outcome is bad, you don't do it again. That's it, very simple, okay? And if you think about why that's happening, it's because the update is occurring on the basis of prediction error. So I thought doing X would be good, I did it. It turned out it wasn't. There was a prediction error, which was negative in this case, which makes it less likely I tried again. Or I did something without being really optimistic about it and I got a really positive effect. So now the prediction error is positive. So therefore, I'm going to be more likely to do it again. Okay. And implicitly here, because he's using words like likely instead of definite, is also the idea that the choice here is probabilistic. Okay. It increases the chances that you take actions that are satisfying, but it does not guarantee you will take them. And as, as I pointed out before, that can be a very useful feature in a world in which you don't begin by having perfectly accurate beliefs. Right? Remember my example of A and B, 10 and 7? So if your beliefs are not accurate, then you don't want to be fully maximizing. You want to be probabilistic in your maximization to allow for some chance of learning about things that you currently have poor beliefs of. So this fundamental process of reinforcement learning is also known as trial and error learning, experiential learning. Uh, psychologists also call it operant or instrumental conditioning. 
and uh, animal behavior folks call it the win stay lose shift rule as the title says right if you win you stay if you lose you go so that's how animals compete with each other for food or for territory or for mates but it's all driven by essentially the same underlying point that it's about prediction error and update based on that and making it more likely to do things that gave you positive surprise less likely to do things that gave you negative surprise okay that's thorndike's law of effect so this is going to be core to any learning model we have to build it has to incorporate this second there's a phenomenon called the power law of practice this is the idea that there are diminishing marginal returns to experience so eventually you get a flattening out of the learning curve so if you remember i started showing you the the the, the class by showing you the picture of the learning curves in terms of cost that's just the mirror image of this if you flip it around and measure learning by performance positive performance then obviously it goes up but in both cases as you can see it flattens out okay this is an observed behavioral property we don't really know much about the psychology of why personally i think the evidence i've read doesn't make clear is this a psychological property or a or a saturation effect right there's like a threshold if the best possible performance is here and you're getting closer and closer it's just going to get harder and harder to improve but whatever it is it would be nice to have models which also reproduce this behavior because we know people do it right if you want to build a model that's behaviorally realistic we want to have the power law of practice in there third is called watson's law of recency okay this is the idea that prediction error matters always but recent prediction errors matter more than prediction errors from very long ago right so recent history is more important in shaping your beliefs than from from uh, history from a very long period ago okay now i want to pause about this and think about this for a second so let's say that you have a series of prediction errors so these are errors this is time right these are time periods and let's say you are here okay so what this says is that this error is going to matter a lot more than this one in shaping your beliefs right now that's what watson's law of recency is saying it's not the only way you could do it right you could imagine just assigning equal weight to all these which is what something like simple averaging would do okay and in fact we we will see later that the the bayesian norm what a good bayesian would do is actually treat these as independent draws average them all together and use that prediction error to make your forecast here but people don't do that right and this is a very robust finding that people do not do that so in mean, studies which are very sophisticated ranging from plugging people into fmris and seeing what's lighting up in their brain onwards to very simple um, tasks uh, using using card games like the vasen's card task or the iowa gambling task sorry it's called the iowa gambling task where you're supposed to decide which deck to pull a card from right and they're kind of looking at the feedback in each period and changing which deck to pull the card from you get this effect all the time that the more recent feedback is the one that has a big impact on you not the past one so let's just stop for a second there and think why do you think natural selection which is a very smart engineer would have built in a feature into humans which has this property of discounting past signals and waiting very heavily on recent signals it's not rational right the bayesian thing to do would be to wait everything Think more about the setting. Go ahead, Piyush. Explain. Uh, so, as in, in my mind, it is about the setting. Like, it is. It can be assumed that the setting, the most recent setting, would be closer to what you, what is happening in this in the current period as compared to what happened many uh, time periods ago. So, I think. Okay. Exactly. So, it's about stability of the task environment. If you live in a fully stable task environment, the 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 correct thing to do would be to average everything. right that's how we take samples when we are doing statistical sampling we assume the task environment is constant take 20 samples average them that's your best estimate of the population parameter right but that only works if the world is constant so it's an interesting indirect inference that the fact that most humans most animals in fact have this tendency to overweight the recent past and forget the distant past so just that evolution is solving a different problem which is how to learn from relatively recent experience in a changing world right that's the only reason why you could that's one reason i wouldn't say only but that's one strong reason why we might have what looks like a bias compared to the bayesian norm but in fact might be the optimal rule if you were placed in a world where things keep changing 
So recency is really a way of accounting for instability in the task environment. Okay, that's really the key point. And last but not the least, uh, there's also this tendency towards exploration in choice. So we're going to hear the word exploration, exploitation quite a lot in this course. So this is the first time I will mention it, but we'll mention it very formally. Exploration is a tendency to take non-optimal action given your current beliefs. Okay, so given your current belief structure, if it says you should do A, but with some probability you also do B, that's exploration. So quite literally, exploration is acting crazy. Okay, because craziness is defined as inconsistency. So it, it's actually a very interesting point that, you know, I, I think I made this observation to some of you, maybe in the core class, or I don't know if I wrote about this. So my, my rant about this is that when I was a grad student, rationality used to be defined as maximizing profits, okay, or utility. And then um, slowly, you know, in the world of economics that kind of changed and they said, well, it doesn't have to be cash. It can be all kinds of utility. That's kind of a relaxation from just maximizing cash, okay. Then after a while they said, uh, well, people don't really have good understanding of their task environment. So it's not maximizing utility, it's maximizing expected utility. Okay, so that means you're, you're doing the best given your beliefs about what will happen, right? And eventually that converged into the modern view of rationality and economics is, is consistency. Rationality is just consistency. It's doing what is consistent given your beliefs. But these models really start from the point that actually in a world where your beliefs are imperfect, Consistency is a handicap, right? Exploration is another way of saying be inconsistent. So do things that are inconsistent given your current beliefs. And that can be in fact the rational thing to do in a world in which your beliefs themselves are imperfect. Because that's the only way you will discover that there are these counterfactuals that you've never explored. So rationality as consistency is kind of in direct contrast to the idea of exploration. Okay, so much so that Jim March wrote a famous paper, in fact, my favorite paper of all his papers, called The Technology of Foolishness. And his central idea in that paper, I don't know if you guys have seen it, if not, I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. But the central idea really is that the purpose of exploration is to get us off these self-confirming paths where we only do things we believe are right and that produces reinforcing feedback and we never explore the alternatives. So he says it's very hard for people to act inconsistently. Right? Our society kind of legitimizes consistency and delegitimizes inconsistent behavior. So that's why I said, just as we have a technology of rationality, I wish there was a technology of foolishness so that people could do inconsistent things and still not have to defend themselves too much. That was his point. So Jim being always very poetic in the way he wrote, he kind of expressed the idea in this language. But at the core of it is a very simple mathematical point. In a world where your beliefs are not accurate and you don't know how inaccurate they are, right? It makes some sense to do things inconsistent with your beliefs. How much? We don't know. But it's clearly not zero. So we have to do at least some exploration in a world in which your beliefs are not optimal, are not accurate. This is the core idea behind exploration. Yeah, Shrupti? Uh, so th this was regarding the previous slide. Uh, you know, in the three different uh, ways of learning, so time differencing and dynamic program, I was wondering where learning from delayed feed feedback uh, fits in? So it's um, all in temporal differencing. So all the four properties I'm showing you here are relevant for temporal differencing. Okay. Um, okay. So this is saying uh, in temporal differencing, you look at the difference between your expectation and your outcome. <clears throat> and that's your prediction error. But what this says in addition is that your prediction errors from the most recent period <clears throat> will be more important for you than your prediction errors from long term. Okay. Ask you a question, uh, Panish, yeah. about the law of recency. So, what really? I was wondering what really decides the weights uh, regarding the recent outcomes. We don't know. It's a great question. So, we know that the tendency is towards recency, but we also know it's not. It's neither constant across people nor within people. So, there are situational cues, right? I think we we have evolved tendencies to change the way towards more recency if we get cues about instability. So if you think our task environment is changing a lot, I think we tend quite rationally to become even more recency oriented. But what I'm pointing out here is even in the absence of any cue, our baseline tendency is to go for recency rather than for equal weights. Okay? But the weights do change and they change across people as well. And I don't think we have a good understanding of why. What we just know is there's a general tendency towards recency. Okay, Nettie? 
Uh, I'm just wondering, besides the law of recency, wouldn't the agent like um, way more about the situation that is closer to the current situation, even though it may be like a long time ago? Yes, so there are also, exactly, so there are situations like that which are called instance-based learning. So this is the idea that the instance that you're looking at is similar to an instance we've seen in the past, and therefore you take feedback from that similar instance more seriously. Right? So there are models doing that as well. So I'm not going to cover them in, in this class because not that they're inaccurate. They're actually sometimes better than the kind of models we are going to talk about. But they add a layer of complexity that we often don't need. Right? For getting the kind of insight we want, we don't need that additional point about instance-based learning. But if you're really trying to understand generalization, when do people generalize from one situation to the other, then I think you have to have a model of instance-based learning. Okay. So we, we will not go there in this class, mainly for time shortages and trying to give you the core of what's important. But uh, I'm happy to point you to references. In fact, Sangyun has done like a beautiful exercise where using experimental data, we've tried to fit both instance-based learning and reinforcement learning to the same data to see which fits better. Right? So he can share that with you and the references. Sangyun, would you make a note of that? Maybe just share that with the class. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So to pull these ideas together, here's the basic algorithm for modeling adaptive rationality, which is essentially the kind of rationality which tries to do what's good for yourself, given your current goals, given your current beliefs, but with some probability also makes mistakes. So you start always, and by now you should be completely uh, unsurprised by this because this is exactly what you saw in the code as well. You start with some initial representation of the task environment. And for the question asked earlier by Jungyo, where does that come from? It could come from vicarious learning, it could come from social learning, it could be hardwired. You take an action in that representation through a choice process. Okay, And that choice process need not be maximization. It could be some probability end up leading to choices other than what is the current best one. That's exploration. You get feedback from the task environment. Right, This point is really crucial. Your actions are conditioned by your beliefs, but the feedback comes from reality. Okay. So once you get the feedback from reality, then you transform your representation through some process based on prediction error. That's temporal differencing. And then the whole cycle repeats again and again. Okay. And step one repeats until some condition is met. So this is like the most basic generic algorithm for modeling individual learning by doing, but it's also true for modeling group learning by doing or even multi-agent learning by doing. That's the core algorithm. Okay. So what's the condition that might stop? It could be reaching a performance outcome. More typically, it's just time. It's when the simulator or the model is modeler is tired. So enough, we do t equal to thousand, and that's enough. Everything is stable, and we stop there. So some condition like that is the stopping condition. But the underlying process always looks like this. So let me pause for a second and say, do you recognize these steps in in the exercise you've already done in preparation for this class? Do, can you see the match one to one between what I'm showing you here and what you did? Yeah, if something is not clear, this would be a good time to clarify that. Okay. All right, um, so this is just a more formal statement of, of this problem. Uh, we are going to use a particular formulation of a task environment, which is very helpful for studying reinforcement learning tasks. This is called a multi armed bandit. Okay, a multi armed bandit has these properties. So let's say there's a set of possible alternatives actions. These are the arms of the bandit. And each of these map onto some performance outcome. The payoffs don't have to be deterministic. So these could be expectations, right? So these could be the expected payoffs with some noise term around them. And um, they have some representation in their mind about what they expect to get when they take these actions, which are the small a's. Then you actually get a performance signal, which is a small pi. Okay, And you might also maintain some kind of a performance aspiration level, if you like. And we can assume typically that our understanding of this task environment is incomplete. We may not know all the possible actions. Inaccurate, right? In the sense that the expected payoffs and the true payoffs may not be the same. And it may also be that the aspiration level is below the global maximum. We don't even know what's the maximal possible payoff we could get in this task environment. So all of these could be properties of the kind of imperfect representations of the world, okay? Uh, we, had, we don't want to assume any of these things going in. We can assume that we don't know these things and we will learn them through our interaction with the task environment. So that's the most general version 
of the uh, multi armed bandit task. You might have seen already in the in the readings or in the videos for this class that the uh, the reason it's called a multi armed bandit is because the origins comes from the slot machine in the casino, right? So there you have the single armed bandits where you put in a coin and you crank it and you know if it if you're lucky you get some money. So imagine instead of one of these you had like an army of slot machines, each with a different expected payoff, and your task was to figure out in which machine should I put my coins. So that I get the best possible payoff, and from that you should be able to also easily imagine the the conceptual analogy to instead of slot machines, think of these as different investment opportunities. Okay, so I got to decide where to invest in in order to get a return and learn about the value of the project. Same idea, right? So that's why these are very useful ways of thinking about any such decision class where we are trying to select among multiple alternatives. We may not have a complete understanding of all possible alternatives. We may not know what their true payoffs are. We may not be very precise in our aspiration level. You might think the global maximum is something when it's not. But the good news is through learning, which is essentially by taking these actions and learning from the feedback, we can improve our understanding of the task environment. That's at the core of what's going on. I thought I saw a hand. Um, so Kanish, do we have an understanding of uh, what makes it worse, whether incompleteness of representation or inaccuracy? Uh, this is a good question. I doubt there is like a general answer because it will depend, as you can imagine, right, on whether the things you don't know about are better or worse than the things you know about. Imagine you had 10 actions in reality and you knew only about eight of them. Suppose the two you don't know about are actually the lowest performing actions, then it really doesn't matter. But suppose they are the best performing actions, then it matters a lot. So it's going to be very task environment specific. I don't know if there's a general answer to that. Okay. Um, let's see who else has their hand up. Neti? Yeah, just to follow up, for example, um, we mentioned that uh, learning by doing is like you can learn about the outcome of an action, but if you don't, you're not aware of the action at all, there's no po possibility that you can learn from it. So how can you in increase the number of N, for example? So um, just to be clear, you may be aware of the action and you may have an expectation about it, but that expectation will not be updated unless you take the action. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, how do we get new actions into our space? That's yes. is that the question. Yeah. Yes. So, so now we, we have to think about it from at two levels. Conceptually, you no. Know, let's start with the modeling. The modeling is easiest, right? You could start first with some actions whose whose expected payoffs are so low that you're never going to actually even try. Them. So it's effectively as if those actions don't exist for you, even though they are in your set. This is one way to think about it. Another way to model this might be that you have a true set of actions, let's say 100, and you are randomly parachuted into a space of three actions, which are neighbors, and you can only see one step neighbors of your actions at any given time. So every time you take an action, your neighborhood changes, and therefore the set of actions change. That would be another way in which we can mechanically model this, right? So modeling this is not a problem. We can incorporate new actions over time, either by starting them with very low expectations and updating later, why, why would we update, even though we didn't take them? Because all the rest may become even worse. So if all the rest become even worse, then these actions which were never part of your set earlier now become part of your set. And a second way is to actually build a task environment where the actor is always looking only in a local neighborhood. And that local neighborhood changes as you move along in this space. So both are ways of technically modeling the problem. Now, conceptually, what does it mean? That's a little harder, okay? But that's exactly what is being modeled in every NK model. That every time you move your local neighborhood, you are being exposed to a new set of design alternatives, which you did not see until you were in that neighborhood. That's conceptually the process that's going on. So we need some story about what might be going on in the real world, the conceptual part, and then the technical part of turning it into a model, that's not hard. That's quite easy to do. Okay. Thank you. Was there another hand? So this is already seen by you. So I want to go through it relatively fast to focus more on the, the conceptual understanding behind them. So as I said, in a multi armed bandit task, we are typically thinking of a set of alternatives which are mapped to performance outcomes. Uh, these can be expectations. These don't have to be 
deterministic. The discreteness of alternatives is just a modeling convenience. Okay. I want to make sure we understand that. What does that mean? What, what does that statement actually mean? So it looks very discrete, right? I have 10 actions. How would I still use the same framework to think about actions which are much more fine grained, if you like? Could I? Or would I have to change something fundamentally about the model? So let's make it concrete, okay? So let's say that we had a corporate conglomerate of some kind with 10 divisions, that's discrete actions. But we said, no, no, we don't want to do it at the level of the division. We want to actually make investments at the level of subdivisional projects. So there are many more fine-grained choices there. How would I be able to incorporate that within this framework of discrete choices? Are you getting the question? Define the set, define the set at that level itself rather than at the yeah. division level. Like, as in, unless there is interdependence between those alternatives, it, nothing should, should change, right? Correct. And so on. So there are three divisions, but then there are projects. There are like, you know, so what, what uh, um, Piyush is suggesting is just set up the mandate at this level. Right. <clears throat> so as long as these alternatives are independent, in the sense the payoff signal I get from taking this action does not depend on anything from occurring or not occurring to this one, exactly like in a typical bandit case, we are fine. This is one way to deal with it. Another is to actually do it in two stages. So you could imagine a sequential bandit where you first take an action on division and then conditional on the division, you then take an action on the project level. There are models that do that as well. So the discreteness is not really very limiting. We can, in the limit, go as fine-grained as you like, just by putting in more alternatives, putting in a sequential structure. So it's just a convenience assumption. Okay. Second, the performance outcomes can be probabilistic. So this is what we usually mean when we say something like a bandit task. We mean that the payoffs are probabilistic. So we can say there's an expected value for each of these, and there's also some noise. Uh, and of course, in the basic bandit task, there is no distance between these actions. Do you see the, the point of, of what I mean? At any given point in time, I'm looking at all the possible actions. So I see everything. And it's not the case that if I took action one in one period, that in the next period, I would be restricted to only looking at a neighborhood action like two, but I would be ruled out from taking a further action like three. There's no concept of distance here. All actions are equally available. Right? This is different from the way NK models work. So in an NK model, your location in the landscape defines a local neighborhood. And in the next period, if you're doing local search, you stay in that neighborhood. Okay. But can we go from this to that? Quite easily. We can redefine these actions. Okay. In terms of some Hamming distance, exactly like in an NK model. So in fact, this might be an interesting exercise for you guys to think about later today is how would I build a bandit model in which there is a concept of distance between the arms? That's it, right? Very simple question. So how can I take the standard deterministic bandit framework with the, uh, the standard, sorry, discrete bandit framework and turn it into a structure where being having picked one action in one period creates some constraint on which other actions I can pick. So to give you a hint, think about this like a network, okay? Where each action is like a node. And when you land on that node, you can, in the next period, only pull one of the actions, which is a one-step neighborhood of that node. That's it, right? Everything else then can be projected exactly onto this, this framework. So it's a very powerful general framework. And of course, there are differences between it and NK and so on. But my strong belief is pretty much anything we can do with the other models, we can do with this as well. Uh, sometimes we can do more. And I want to explain the more as well. Any um, questions on this part, on the task environment? Oh. Uh... Can we can we map in you know interdependencies like we do in the NK model by using this concept of Hamming distance? Uh, yes, we can. So what we could do is to to fully replicate in from the NK to this world. You need two things. You need a, a way of capturing proximity 
which I just told you how you could do it by creating a network structure where the actions are nodes. So proximity is well defined in a network. And second, you need to seed the payoff structure to have ruggedness. Mm. Right. In other words, you want the payoffs for certain nodes to be highly correlated in the neighborhood. If they're not highly correlated, you're going to get a rugged landscape. If they're highly correlated, you're going to get smooth peaks and valleys. So if I take both these steps, then I can fully reproduce the NK world. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So what does interdependency mean in the NK world? It means that the payoff to taking one action depends on the other actions, and the bundle of actions is a node in this network, in my story. So in my network, uh, let's say this is one node. This could be 101. There could be another node, which could be 001. There could be another one, which is 111. Right? So these are like in some neighborhood of each other. And in the NK world, if the payoffs of this are very similar to the payoffs of this and this, then we get a smooth landscape. If it turns out that the payoff next door is 0.1 and this one is like 0.2, then it's a rugged landscape. Right. Ruggedness is just a function of how much do the payoffs change when you move one step in any direction. We can fully capture that in the network, right? No problem. Okay, so this is the task environment. <clears throat> now we come to the representation. So given this set of alternatives, we have to have some beliefs about what the expected values of these actions are. Uh, where do they come from? They could be hardwired, they could be learned from conversation, maybe I just dreamt it up, I had, I had some inspiration of some kind, and I formed these expectations, okay? And the key point, of course, is that the expected payoffs may not be the true payoffs. It could be lower, it could be larger, it's different, okay? But these representations are the core elements that are going to be affected by learning. So when we say learning, we're really talking about the dynamics of these beliefs, these representations. And the language we often use is the first period representation are called priors, exactly like in Bayes' rule, right? So in Bayesian thinking, the initial belief structure is your prior, and then you get the posterior. So the priors here are your initial beliefs or initial representations. So we can play a lot with the effects of different kinds of initial representations. We can also play with, uh, in more complicated models where you have more than one agent, the effect of those initial beliefs being the same across agents or different, right? One of the papers that I'm going to ask you to try to replicate, which is one of mine, actually makes this point that even in a world where people's beliefs are not accurate, right? But their actions are coupled. There are interdependencies across actors. It can actually be helpful for people to be wrong in the same way. So even if our priors are inaccurate, having the same inaccurate prior is better than having two different inaccurate priors. That's something that we show in one of the papers, right? So you can play with this a lot. You can also think about hierarchical structures where the person at the top is really shaping the priors of everybody below them, just like a boss dictating stuff to their subordinates. And you can ask the question, when is that good or bad for the system, given that the boss is not necessarily wiser than the subordinates? Okay, so that I think corresponds very often to reality. So it's a good question to ask, right? What is the value of standardizing priors? What's the value of hierarchical influence on priors? So once we understand how these representations work and how they get updated, then we can do a lot of interesting things with them. So this is the second element, which is the belief structure, the representation of the agents. This is okay? Okay. Third, choice. So given this set of alternatives, we want to select an action. And it's quite become the standard now, the industry standard to use a way of doing this, which is called softmax, uh, but is actually equivalent to uh, what this uh, game theorist and mathematician Luce had, had stated a long time ago. And it's called Luce's choice rule. And the basic idea is that the probability of taking an action at any period, right? Probability of taking action K at time T is a function of the expected value of that action divided by this parameter tau, the whole thing divided by the sum of the expected values, exponentiated expected values of all the payoffs of all the actions, okay? So I, I don't know if the, the notation is transparent enough, but if you've played with the code, then you should see exactly how this works. So let's actually write it out for one or two cases and we'll see. So let's say there are only two actions, A and B. Okay. So 
we can write this now as the expected payoff for A. And we have a notation here for time. Okay, versus the expected payoff for B also at time T. So what this says is that the probability of taking action A at time T, I'm just translating the equation on the slides to this case, right? Is this effectively the E exponentiation of the expected action for time A, for action A at time T divided by this parameter tau, which is the exploration parameter. And the whole thing divided by the sum, actually let's forget the sigma since there are only two actions. So it's just going to be That's it. Okay. So why are we doing this? <clears throat> Let's try and understand like why we would do any of this. Why would we, for instance, forget about the exponentiation and just use the values themselves? Why would we want to divide by these tau's? Why don't we just set tau equal to one? These are possible, right? These are also perfectly reasonable ways of proceeding. You might say, I don't need to exponentiate anything. I just need a probability. So I just need a ratio. And this is going to be between zero and one, right? If I just take the values of these expectations. So why couldn't I just do that? What's the advantage of exponentiating and what's the advantage of dividing by tau? Any ideas? It kind of makes the high probability more high probable, and low probability, low probable. Okay, so it kind of creates this sigmoidal function, right? So it kind of pulls towards the top, pulls, pulls towards the bottom, yeah. And uh, what is the uh, what is the what's the combination of the exponentiation and the tau doing? In particular, let's let's focus on tau first. So what happens if tau becomes very very small? Let's think about this. If this becomes nearly zero, it can't be zero because I can't divide by zero. But let's say this becomes super small, 0 0.001. What's it going to do? It's going to blow up this value. Right? This will be huge. It's going to blow up everything. And therefore, exactly as Jung you said, it's going to make the large values look very large compared to the small values. What's the exponentiation doing on top of that? Think about an exponentiation function, right? If you put in positive values, what outcome do you get? A positive number. If you plug in a negative number, what do you get? Also a positive number. Okay. So this is really a way of converting everything into the positive domain. Combined with tau, which is the exploration parameter, what it's really doing is giving you a way of converting everything into the positive domain. So that you don't have the problem of these canceling out, right? If one was negative, one was positive, it'd be a headache otherwise. But the tau is really the thing that we want to focus on because that's controlling the level of exploration in the search process. So if tau is very, very small, then the differences between the expected payoffs look huge to you. And therefore, the probability of picking the higher one becomes very, very high, close to one. But if tau becomes large, then it's as if all actions are roughly equivalent, which means you kind of ignore your belief structure and pick at random, right? Remember how we defined exploration? We said exploration is the probability of taking actions other than the current best ones. So if tau becomes very large, the probability of taking actions other than your current best ones goes up. If tau becomes very small, then it becomes exploitation. You pick the action that's currently best in your belief structure. So that's why tau is such a crucial variable in these models. It tunes the exploration exploitation trade-off. Right. One of the things that you could also do, given the models you have, is just run a simple analysis to show that if you look at cumulative performance with tau, you should get a curve like this. Okay. That's the exploration exploitation trade off. So you should be able to replicate that. And interestingly, you will get this even if the payoffs are fully deterministic, even if there's no noise in the payoff. You should still be able to get this, this basic figure. That's what the exploration exploitation trade off is basically about. Right. Uh, why is there a trade-off? You have all the ingredients now to answer that. Why, why do we get this shape? Why should we get this shape always? 
If the tau is way too high, then it it will keep on choosing the. It won't give enough weightage to the good outcomes. It will keep on shuffling between the good and the bad outcomes. And if it is way too low, it won't even go for the probabilities that are low. It will always keep on choosing that seven instead of the ten. All very good. Okay, exactly. So if you want to frame this in learning language and in a way that non-modelers can understand, you would say if tau is very high, then you don't benefit from what you have learned. Because your beliefs are good, but you don't use them, right? You're still kind of choosing at random. But if tau is very low, you don't learn enough because you're stuck picking the seven over the 10. So what tau is doing is essentially tuning the extent to which you can learn about the environment by challenging your beliefs and the extent to which you can benefit from what you've learned by picking the action that comes from your beliefs. That's why you get the exploration exploitation trade-off. Okay? That's it. That's the core reason why we will see this. And this is like a very generic property of any learning system that it has to have a degree of tau which is not zero now the the horrendous problem is what's the optimal value of tau okay very hard to know except in some very special cases where we can fully characterize the task environment and it's stable and it has a lot of other properties so there are some very smart ways of trying to solve this problem even for non-stationary task environments i mean you can imagine there are millions of billions of dollars riding on fixing this problem for learning systems, whether it's self-driving cars or heat-seeking missiles or anything like that. That's the problem, right? We're all trying to solve exploration exploitation. So it's a big problem. And there are very smart ways of trying to solve it based on things like the um, Gittins index, which is a heuristic method based on taking data from all your past trials and applying essentially the logic of Bellman equations, where you look at stationary states and compare last period to next. It works in many cases. It doesn't in many as well. There's something called Thompson sampling, which is another way of trying to tune this exploration parameter over time in response to your performance and feedback. So these are technicalities that I won't go into for now. But what I want to mention for now is this plays a very important role in our discussion of learning because exploration exploitation is at the heart of it. Last thing I will mention for you to try and play around with a little bit on your own. A lot of the models you see assume this is fixed. Okay. And to be honest, this is really more a convenience. There's really no reason why we have to make this assumption. In fact, if you think about performance feedback theory, learning based on performance feedback, one way to interpret that theory into this structure is to say tau should depend on how high your payoff is above or below an aspiration level. So if you're doing very well compared to your aspiration level, then maybe tau can be small. But if your performance falls below an aspiration level, then tau should endogenously be tuned up, right? So this is the first assignment that I would like you guys to attempt for next week. Given the same model structure you already have, marry it to the performance feedback learning theory by tuning the tau to be endogenous to your performance respect to aspiration level. That's it, one simple ask, okay? And it's very easy to do. So the follow on reading for today is actually the paper by Viva and Henrik where they give an overview of the literature on performance feedback theory. So having read that, your task is to convert their verbal theory into the formulation of this model. And I've already given you a clue as to how to do it, which is to make tau contingent on performance with respect to an aspiration. Okay. I thought I saw some hands earlier. Maybe I missed, missed a hand. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah, this so Jung Yoon first, uh, Jung Yoon first, and then Pulkit. Uh, so I, I was wondering, uh, it, it is about it is regarding the conceptual understanding of exploration and exploitation trade-off, and mm -hmm. was wondering if it is only applied to learning by doing, or also it also includes social learning or other uh, ways of learning. So I was going to postpone this discussion to next session, but let me give you the gist of the answer, okay? Mm -hmm. So in our framework so far, which I've shown you three of the elements, let me just quickly show you the fourth as well, mm -hmm. uh, okay? The question you might ask is firstly, where does social learning fit into this picture? Mm -hmm. If you were to introduce social learning into this basic framework of these four steps, where would it fit in? So obviously mm -hmm. one place it would fit in is through your priors. Yeah. The second place it might fit in is by tuning your tau based on the aspiration of performance of others, right? The third place it might fit in is actually how you update your beliefs over time. So if you look at these equations, which is capturing how your beliefs update over time, okay? 
And you can see these are based on essentially prediction errors, right? That's what it's actually doing. And I'll explain that in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, you, could, you could have social learning play a role in generating signals about prediction errors. So social learning can be added on as a layer on top of the same basic model we have in these different places. But uh, what will change is if you are an agent that's in a world that you did not begin by already understanding, mm -hmm. you will still have to face the exploration exploitation problem. Uh, okay. yeah. What social learning may do is change the way you tackle the exploration exploitation problem. It might make you explore more through changing the social aspiration level. Uh, it might give you more signals than you got on your own, right? Because you now have feedback signals from others. It might change your priors, mm -hmm. but it cannot change the fact that if you're an entity that enters a world without already knowing that world fully, you face an exploration exploitation problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Make sense? Yeah, it's super clear. Okay. All right, full kit. Professor, my question is regarding using the exponential function because quite a lot of these probability uh, is depend on using that exponential function. Uh, is there some optimization done on that to use the exponential function? I mean, it could have been an N also depending on the number of choices that you have. So yeah, yeah, it, it could. Have, so I, I think I'm, I haven't myself tried playing with different okay. functions of this. Actually, I did once long ago just with averaging in a world where everything was positive anyway, just as a robustness check. Uh, I, I don't know enough to be able to tell you that this is the best way to do it. Okay. I know enough that this is the most common way to do it. Okay. Okay. And if you look, probably you will find some reasons why it has become the industry standard. Uh, but it is standard surprisingly, not only in our world, but also in... Um, uh, actually, this softmax function occurs in many, many applications, not connected to learning as well. Ekin, you might know this. Isn't this part of the Boltzmann equation as well? Isn't that how they how they write the... Yeah, yeah, it is uh, both the both the Einstein distribution. I think if I if I remember, I did, we use it in statistical physics as well. Uh, as well yeah. That is so, true. Yeah. So there must be some very good mathematical properties of why this exponentiation is so robust. So I can't tell you what they are, but uh, okay. let's just assume they're there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is probably the most important part of these four steps. So I want to spend a little bit of time making sure this is super clear. So we want to transform the probabilities of selecting actions through these recursive equations. And um, for very simple systems, we can do it directly on the probability. Okay. So literally I can say probability at time t is a function of my prior probability plus the payoff. So you can already see how difficult this becomes if you have many choices. If you have two choices, it's very easy, right? So you remember the game we were playing earlier that it was a business dilemma kind of game. So I have two choices, you have two choices. So obviously the probability of doing this is going to be one minus the probability of doing that. So it's easy, I can update it. But suppose I had 10 choices. How do I conserve probabilities? Okay, that can become a nightmare. So the more general way of doing it is actually not on the probabilities, but on the expected payoffs for each action, which are then put through some function like softmax. Okay, so now the question really is, how do I update the expected payoffs themselves? in each period, how do I update those based on feedback? So the model that we'll use as default, uh, one of two, you can try both. The default one that I like a lot and I use a lot in my work is this thing called exponential recency weighted average. So it's a mouthful, but we can call it ERWA for short. Um, here's how it works. So you can see the expected payoff for the action K at time T is the prior period expected payoff for the same action plus that thing in brackets, which is the prediction error, right? That's the prediction error. It's the difference between what I thought I'd get and what I actually got, multiplied by this parameter phi, okay? And it's subscripted i because it can be agent specific. We can have different learning rates for different agents, but forget the i for now. Uh, just, just ignore i in all this notation. So the parameter phi is basically your learning rate. Can you see that? So if I make phi zero, what's going to happen in that equation? Nothing. My next period expectation is the same as my prior period expectation, right? No learning. So phi is zero, no learning. If phi is one, what happens? Updating it to a new observation. Only based on the last period. Everything else is forgotten. Can you see that? Because I've rewritten the equation twice. If you look at it in the second way I've written it, I just rearrange the terms. That makes it very transparent. What happens when phi is zero? I just stick to my prior period belief. 
what happens if fee is one? I just use my last period payoff to update my belief and I forget the entire history before that, right? Notice these are recursive equations, which means I've written it for one period, for t and for t minus one, but obviously every period is counting the previous period. That's why it's called recursive, okay? So it's a recursive equation. So this is one of the most powerful general ways of thinking about updating expectations, which then can be fed into softmax like this, from which you draw your choice. Now, why do I like this? First, it has law of effect built in. Right? You can see law of effect is there in this equation. If something produces a good outcome, the prediction error is positive. And if phi is positive, then obviously it increases the chances of my wanting to do it again because my expected payoff goes up. It has the power law of practice. Why? Because phi is bounded between zero and one. So you can see if you compound this over time, it will take a sigmoid is as a S shaped function where it kind of flatten out towards the end over time. So you get the power law of practice. It has the law of recency. So what I call the learning rate, which is phi, is doing double duty. Phi is both your learning rate as well as your recency rate. That's like a super subtle point, which often takes a long time for people to realize. But recency and learning rate really are the same thing. Why do we say that? So can you reinterpret the second version of this equation where phi is no longer described as a learning rate, but as a recency effect? You can, right? If phi is one, that means the recency is super high. You just care about last period. If phi is zero, you don't care about the last period at all, right? So recency and learning rate are just two ways of describing the same idea. Okay? So it has all three. And we, we started out, remember, saying we wanted to have learning models which have these properties, that they have law of effect, they have power law of practice, they have law of recency. So this is why this is usually my default model of choice. Uh, occasionally, reviewers, and for our own interest to, to benchmark, we might also do something like simple averaging. So here, what I've written is the, the second equation is a case where the expected payoff for action k at time t is the prior period one multiplied by the number of times that action has been sampled plus the immediate prior period payoff divided by n. So this is just saying add up all the payoffs you got from taking this action and divide it by the number of times you took that action. So that still has law of effect, right? It still has power law of practice. And if you put this pi into softmax, it will still have probabilistic choice exploration, but it won't have law of recency. You see that? So I'd like somebody to explain this back to me. Just, I want to make sure we are absolutely clear on this. So could somebody please explain why the formula at the bottom has all the other three properties, but not, or just explain why it doesn't have law of recency, whereas the formula above does. Any volunteers? I think you can understand it as like a simple average. So on the uh, numerator, you have like n minus one items of um, the t minus one payoff, and then mm -hmm. an item of um, the actual outcome. So you're actually giving them like equal ways instead of giving more ways to the reason outcome. So remember I, I earlier drew this figure? These are time periods. These are your payoffs in each period. Yeah. So if you look at this and look at these equations, it should be completely transparent what Nettie is saying. So the second equation is just giving equal weight to all of these. The first equation says, actually, in any given period, you take a weighted average between the expectation up to that period and the current period payoff. So I can tune how much I put the weight on the past versus the immediate payoff. That's the Right? So phi is literally tuning the past versus immediate curve. So that's what allows me to tune the law of recency. Whereas if I simply average everything, by definition, there is no law of recency. Okay. So the first equation is the one that I think meets the properties of behavioral plausibility. The second equation is the one that's in some sense simpler because it has one parameter less. Right? We don't have the phi. And for some people, they, they want to see this because they think this is the Bayesian norm. So if you're being Bayesian, this is what you should do. I mean, I've never really understood the logic of that because it's only the Bayesian norm if you know the task environment is stationary, right? And even if you as the modeler know, 
it's not clear the agent knows <laughs> right so this is like one of those things which it's useful i think a good hygienic practice to try both to see how much your results depend on it uh, most most often for the kinds of things we do it doesn't make a difference where it does you should be aware it does and why and is that still important or not so i would take these two as your basic toolkit for the updating equations but notice in both that the core of it is prediction error right in both of these what's happening is essentially a signal which gets transformed into prediction error and then you update your beliefs based on that that's very explicit in the way i wrote the equation above but it's also pretty clear in the averaging rule right because i'm taking your expected expectation of the of the values to all prior periods and then the current one and i'm adding them up together and taking their average so you can think of the difference between them as a prediction error and by averaging the two you're trying to reduce that right so all of these are based essentially on prediction error based updating now let's go back to the world of words for a bit okay away from the world of equations this is a description from a paper by a guy called louis which is very nice i think because it gives the clearest definition of what sense making means the term is not his the term is karl weicks right you might have encountered it in some class before so the idea of sense making is a very important one in organization theory but he gave this verbal description of it and what i want you to appreciate is how the verbal description matches perfectly the elements in the equation right so i'd like somebody to volunteer to explain to me how do the highlighted pieces in the text match to the equation above which part goes with which part so i guess the recurring cycle would be that in every period you are constantly updating your beliefs based on uh, the prior periods uh, observed uh, performance correct. so the t and t minus 1 are capturing yeah. the recurring cycle correct mm -hmm. yeah. uh, predictions about future events is basically are uh, predicting t based on t minus 1 yeah um discrepancy is the terms in the bracket so prediction yeah. error and then updated and predictions about future experiences in the setting are revised is basically yeah the updating of uh, pi in time t through phi right so the updating the updating yeah, strength is captured yes. by phi so that's the parameter here okay uh, one can also look at things like um, so there are two properties also in this equation which are implicit but if you look at it hard enough you can see they are there one is path dependence so depending on where you started at t0 right as long as phi is is not one if phi is one then your initial period beliefs don't matter at all why because we already did this right if phi is one the only thing that matters is the last period so then what you began believing here won't matter but if phi is anything less than one then where you started will always have an effect on where you end in terms of your beliefs you see that right just imagine this equation written out for multiple time periods i've written it in just one period of t and t minus 1 but imagine writing it with t minus 2 t minus 3 t minus 4 and you can see that if phi is less than 1 then where you started is going to always have an effect so it will cast a very long shadow on this process so your priors will matter right second you can also think about steady state conditions so what's the steady state in this equation it would be when your expectations don't get changed even if phi is greater than 0 so if period to period your expectations don't change then you've reached a steady state right so if pi i k t is the same as pi i k t minus 1 even if phi is greater than 0 how can that happen it can only happen if you've correctly figured out what the expected payoff is because that's exactly the true payoff you're getting is this clear maybe i should write it out to make the point so let me rewrite this equation i'll drop the i i'll just focus on the at This is big pi. Okay, same equation. This should be here actually. Same equation. So, what does a steady state mean? A steady state means these two are equal even when phi is greater than zero. How can that be? That can only be if this is zero. Right? How is that going to be zero? If the actual payoff and your expectation are identical. So, you nailed it. So the steady state here would be that you actually correctly understood what the expected payoffs would be, right? And this is for one action, but you can imagine steady state for all actions. So that would be how you would get to steady state here. 
All right, so this is basically the technical part of, of how we represent our single agent learning model. We've gone through all the logic for this. We can now start looking, I guess, at your results from your application exercise. Um, this is, I think, obvious. It's a key element for a lot of different application things you could do. Um, <clears throat> so in the, in the code and the exercise I gave you, we parameterized it a little bit more. So we said, let the maximum payoff when we're setting up the task environment be one. And all the other payoffs we said can lie in zero to delta, right? Where delta lies in zero to one. Do you remember this? It's familiar? Yes, no? Okay. So first question, what does S mean and what does delta mean? How would you interpret this to a person who doesn't know anything about models? So what, what does S mean in the real world? And what does delta mean? I, I think I know the meaning of S. S is the alternative I can choose from. Well, I was not sure about delta. Delta must be um, the the uh, the efficiency or the reward of your second second best choice compared yes, to the yeah, first best choice. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. So if you have many choices here, and let's say there is a global peak at one, this is delta. Right. So one minus delta is telling you basically the gap between the global peak and the next best. So what does that mean? In, and that's in the model, but in the real world, what, what could this mean? Maybe loss of not choosing the best option. Okay. So can we think of examples where um, Delta is one versus examples where Delta may be quite low. Think of real world environments where Delta is very high. It's nearly one versus uh, environments in which delta is actually quite low. Delta high can be investing in something like NFT, what happened after yesterday, instead of investing in something that is more stable, let's say gold or dollars, that would be pretty low delta. So remember, delta is a property not of a choice, but of a task environment, right? Even though in this picture I've shown it as if it's this, but actually delta tunes the property of the task environment, which is the gap between the first and second best. So what's a task environment in which the gap between finding the global peak versus only getting to the second best matters a lot versus one in which doesn't matter much? Is it ruggedness? It is ruggedness. It is really capturing a property very similar to ruggedness, right? So one way to think about it is Delta could be very low in a winner take all market. Okay, so if you're trying to launch the new iPhone or some, some new technological product and the demand function for, for this product, which is late and nobody knows it, is such that if you get it exactly right, you kill the market. But if you're off even by a little bit, you do poorly. Okay, this would be a case where Delta is relatively small. Delta is very high, it could be something like, um, uh, maybe something like fashion, right? There are many comparably good peaks in that landscape, okay? We just need to find something. It doesn't really matter if we don't get to the absolute absolute global first best, okay? One can also imagine a case where not only is delta one, but all payoffs are delta and delta is equal to one, in which case really doesn't matter which action I pick. So that's like a pure coordination problem. We just need to pick one action and it doesn't matter which one we pick, we just pick one, right? So depending on how much is the extent of a winner take all dynamic in the market, this is one way to think about what Delta is doing. Uh, another could be landscapes and task environments differ a lot in, in the extent to which the ruggedness is high or low. So a case where Delta is small is a highly rugged landscape. A case where Delta is equal to one is a fairly smooth landscape. There's not a big difference between one point and the next. So it is playing the same role as ruggedness does in an NK model. It's not exactly the same for reasons we'll talk about, but it is doing approximately the same thing, which is telling you the gap between the first and the second best. Okay. Uh, as in, so Fanish, isn't it the opposite of what you said, where rugged means where there is the delta is very high, like all the peaks are almost as similar to each other, but smooth means that there is only one global peak. Um, no, so that's the reason why they are not exact equivalents. But if you think about the behavior of the system, what happens in a rugged landscape? The penalty of being trapped at a non-global peak is quite large. 
right? Because you're going to get trapped into many peaks and the average value of the peaks is going to be quite small compared to the global peak. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity cost of entrapment is high in a rugged landscape. And that is the same when delta is small, right? So, so to make them fully equivalent, think about it as the opportunity cost of falling or getting entrapped in a non-global peak. Okay, it's a bit of a, we have to do some mental judo, but <laughs> that's yeah. what it is. It's the opportunity that's cost. Of the that's what NK is. Yeah. <clears throat> that's what it is, right? So, <laughs> okay. Because the, in the, so this is one of the problems, if you like, with the NK framework, that the K thing actually moves quite a few things in the model without telling you. So it's moving both mm -hmm. the number of peaks, but also the average expected values of the peaks. Yeah. Okay. And that, that simultaneous effect is one of the reasons why their interpretation can be challenging. This is fully transparent. This just tells you, so what's the expected value in this bandit, right? It's the, the expected value of not being on the peak is basically just the, if it's a uniform distribution, it's delta by two. That's it, right? There's no, no mystery about it. And we can make the uh, gap between the first best and the next best as small or as large as we like and find some way to interpret different task environments based on that. Now, second question, is there any relationship among alternatives other than ordering in terms of payoffs. Are certain actions like, is A1 closer to A2 than to AS? Is A2 closer to A3 than uh, it is to A5? No, this is not, right? So in this very basic model, you recreated all actions are equidistant. And you see them all to begin with. There's no hidden action. All actions are known, they're equidistant. At any period, you can jump to any one of them. Okay, so it's not like NK in that sense. It's looking like a much more a smaller scale problem, if you like. So maybe we have four technology standards and we're trying to figure out which is the best one. So there are only four. And at any given period, you might be running some experiments or prototypes with any one of them. But in the next period, you could jump to any of the other ones easily. It's not like I can't go to standard four unless I am at standard three, right? That's not happening in this model. So this is a global search model in this case. Piyush? So in NK, I had another question. Like, so typically, we, like, the modelers there equate the different arms that is N to different functions within an organization. So one, one could be strategy, other is marketing. Is, <clears throat> is there something similar that we can think of in this environment where instead of these being alternatives, these are different parts of the organization? So, okay, this is worth getting into in some detail. So can I assume everybody has seen the Tom Society meeting, uh, the Tom Summer School material on the NK model? So everybody's familiar with the NK model? Yes, no? If you're not, then what I'm going to say for the next five minutes will sound like Greek, right? I'm not picking on Greeks. Maybe you can say Turkish if you like. But it will make no sense to you. But hopefully you have seen it. So the first point is that the N in the NK does not correspond to the N in terms of arms in these models. Why not? Because in the NK model, an arm in our world, in their world, is actually a set of choices along N dimensions. So that vector of choices, which could be like 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, this is like an arm. Right? The whole thing is an arm, not each piece. Because in the NK world, you don't choose each piece, you choose the whole arm. Now, of course, in any given period, you change only one of the pieces, which gets you to a new arm, which is some hanging distance away from this arm. Right? But it is an arm. It's an entire arm. Where does the ruggedness come in? The ruggedness comes in because by construction, we seed the payoff such that something that looks almost the same, this is the only difference. They have completely different payoff. That's where the ruggedness comes in. Okay? Why does it come in? Because the idea implicitly captured by creating this kind of ruggedness is to say there are some complementarities between these actions. So if you did everything right, but you got this one wrong, by picking a one instead of a zero, you get a bad outcome, right? So effectively what NK is the framework for is to tell you how to model the fact that there are dependencies between these actions that change the payoffs a lot if you just tweak one. So a very good analogy is to think about picking a combination lock if you're a thief. Okay, you got to pick the right combination on somebody's briefcase. So if you get it all right, it will open. You're off by one, the alarms will go off. That's a rugged landscape. Okay, and it's capturing the dependencies between those. In our world, 
we have just discrete arms and there are no direct dependencies between the arms. So it's not like when I pick arm one and arm two, then something wonderful happens because in this model, you only pick arm one or arm two in any period. Okay. So if you want to go between these two worlds, you have to start thinking about how can I think of an arm as a bundle of attributes? That's easy, right? For every one of these strings, I can say there's an arm. And more importantly, how do I capture the fact that this arm is close to this arm? Because here it's close, it's only one step away, right? So how do I do that in my framework? Well, I gave you a hint, right? You treat each of these arms as a node in the network. And then we are in business because we can treat each of these as an arm, which is a collection of these bits. And then we can create one step, two step, three step distances between them and so on. So that's the way to think about going between NK versus this, right? So it's a long answer to the point, but N is not equivalent in these two. It's called NK and we're using the word N. Actually, I'm not. That's the reason why I call it S. Okay. So here it's S and S is really the number of alternatives, but an alternative is really a bundle of choices in the NK world. And the basic bandit formulation does not have any means of capturing dependencies between these actions. We can add them along the lines of what I've shown you, and I'll show you some other ways to do it as well. But in the basic model, there is no way of capturing dependencies between actions. These are completely independent. You take one action, you take the other one. Each time you get a separate payoff. Okay. Piyush, is that okay? Is that clear? Yes. All right, then, <clears throat> so two questions, again, based on the model you already built. So what do these random priors really imply? So yes, mechanically, we can create random priors, but what do they mean for you? How would you interpret it to a person who's not into the modeling? They want you to give them like a verbal explanation. What does it mean you randomize priors? Do people walk into the world randomly? Or do they go around carrying random views about the world? What does it mean? So I want you to give me an explanation of why we put in these random priors that would convince me if I didn't know anything about models or modeling or even what randomization means. How would you convince me? I see it was saying there is no one formal or, um, or one, one kind of norm or culture that people agree on. They, people can, you know, organizations can have different kind of perspectives or beliefs so that we can uh, see what happens. Yeah, so there's diversity. So each one has a different prior, but we're saying more than that. We're also saying in expectation, there is no wisdom. Even on average across them, there's no particular insight about what's going on in the world, right? So if I just randomize these priors and I took their average, then that's not going to tell me, On typically it will tell me nothing about where the true global peak is. So it's both heterogeneity as well as the assumption of ignorance. So remember when we were talking about modeling adaptive rationality, we said we start with ignorance and then we build up through learning. This is really a way of embodying the idea of ignorance. How about the assumption that the representation is also of dimension S? What does that mean? What are we assuming when we assume that? Every action is associated to an outcome. True. Or like performance. More precisely, all possible actions are already known to you. Okay. All possible actions are known to you. It's just that their payoffs are not. So the only uncertainty being captured in the model is about the value of those actions. There's no uncertainty in this basic model about how many actions there are. They're all here. Okay. But as I said earlier, it's not hard to go from this to a world where the actions themselves can change over time. Either we can do it through the networking approach where we have local neighborhoods. Or you can start by assigning some of these actions very low expected payoffs, so you never actually sample them. So imagine I took these S and partitioned them into two groups. One group have expectations, say, from 0.5 to 1, and the other has from 0 to 0.1. It's as if the ones between 0 and 0.1 don't really exist. Why? Because when you put them through softmax, unless tau is super high, all the lower attraction events will never be called. Right? They are not going to select them. So it's as if they don't exist. But over a period of time, you may end up discovering them because it may turn out that all these high attraction choices you were going after are actually lousy ones. So then as their expected payoffs sink low, you may get to a point where their expected payoffs become point 0 0.01, in which case suddenly point 0.1 looks fantastic. And softmax will help you discover this action. 
right? So there are ways to, to build the idea of discovery of actions into the basic model. But in the current version that you have, the assumption simply is all possible actions are known. Okay, then we have softmax. We already discussed the random priors idea. And finally, we um, put in these uh, updating equations. We are using EWRA. Yeah, sorry, it should be EWRA, not ERWA. And where fees in zero one. Now, how would you explain the difference between two actors who have different fees? So in our computations, we will typically vary all the possible values of fee and then look at the robustness of results and so on. But if somebody said, what does it mean that you have a fee of 0.9 and I have a fee of 0.5? Can you explain that to me in English? What does it mean? What does it correspond to in the real world? I guess someone who has higher level of phi is learning a lot from the past experience, meaning that they're reflecting a lot of, um, they are capturing a lot of information about their prediction error errors, while um, someone who has low fee means that they are not actually learning from pr prior prediction errors. Okay, good. So it's simply a question of how sensitive they are to feedback, right? So if fee is zero, you're not sensitive to feedback. Your beliefs don't change. If fee is one, you're super sensitive to feedback. But along with sensitivity also comes a statement about recency. So when you have fee equal to one, you're also saying that I'm sensitive in the specific sense of paying a lot of attention to most immediate feedback, right? It's not the only way we could have modeled this. It is in this particular formula. So can you imagine for a second, a formula where we can disentangle the idea of being sensitive to feedback versus being sensitive to recent feedback? The two are bundled together here, right? But can we pull them apart? Is the question clear? You can see in this equation that two things are going on, right? So I'm, I'm tuning the sensitivity to feedback, but implicitly I'm also tuning the recency effect. Can I disentangle these into a world where first I kind of decide, do I pay attention to feedback? Yes, no. If I do, then the next question is which feedback? The most recent one or the old one or everything? So how would I think about a two-stage updating process? Maybe adding another term with T minus two that captures everything else. Okay. That could be one way. Maybe if we can allocate fee for every prior um, rewards and like P, P1, P2, P, Pn, then we can separate them. That would be another way. It was fairly complicated because you have to have a huge vector of fees in as big as your time series. But it could do it, I agree. This is a this is a nice one to solve, okay? Think about this and uh, come up with some ideas before next class. What are some ways in which we can separate out the, the point about, do I pay attention to feedback from which feedback do I pay most attention to, okay? And you can see the version we have right now is bundling the two together. So are there smart ways of unbundling them? That's a nice opportunity. I haven't actually seen anybody do this. And it, it will fit naturally into our plans for next week because you can probably see this already. This is quite tightly connected to the notion of aspiration-driven search, right? So if you're above some aspiration, you may not even do any updating, but conditional on being below the aspiration, you may update, but then whether you update based on recent or past feedback could be tuned. So it's a way also of marrying these two classes of models, which are performance-based feedback versus reinforcement learning, all right? Okay, so you've done this, I assume, and you were able to uh, get some results out of this. And hopefully you could replicate the patterns of results here, right? So could you get these four graphs? Everybody, yeah? Okay, I, I do want to make sure that, you know, people understand this basic single agent case well, because uh, this is like a building block. So in fact, what we might do is, Samuel, do you mind just projecting the code from your machine on the single agent case? I want to just walk people through it to make sure that everything is clear. I think the Tom Society page also had very detailed explanation of my code that Marlo did. So if you haven't seen it, I, I strongly recommend do, doing that because if you master these basic elements, we're going to reuse them again and again. So Sangyun will walk you through his version. Is yours the same as mine, Sangyun, or did you redo it from scratch? I use some components of yours. Okay. 
So you can see my screen, right? Yeah, you can. So you want me to go through from the uh, no, I, I, I can talk just through it. I can see it. But what I want people to see here is the reusability and the modular nature of the code nice. that we're trying to develop. Okay. Because I want us to all for the exercises for this class, really. But even going forward after that, there is no reason why you have to reinvent how to do softmax each time. Okay. It's a bit tricky. And once you understand how to do it, you do it once and it's done. So I want to build like these reusable code libraries where anybody can just plug and play. And this will also help with error correction, right? Because if somebody finds an error, everybody will benefit. So we should try and standardize to the extent we can on the code, right? You and I are not going to be competing in our field on the quality of our code. That's for computer scientists. We're going to compete on correctness and novelty of how we recombine these ideas, okay? So correctness is a given, it has to be correct. But the novelty is really in the recombination. So as far as possible, we try to keep things simple and replicable. So look at the function defining the task environment. Right? It literally is translating our slide into Python. So it has two parameters, S and Delta, and that's exactly what you're seeing there. Okay? Similarly for softmax, if you look at it, it literally follows the steps needed to construct, right, it's gone now, but the steps needed to construct the adding up after exponentiation and taking the ratio after having divided by tau, right? That's temperature in this model. So once you have this written, you don't need to do it again and again, right? The three things entering this function are the vector of attractions for all the choices, the tau, which is temperature, and the size of the attractions, the dimension. Okay, so just try and reuse them as far as you can, as far as possible. Uh, this is the updating rule. This is the prediction error base. So literally you can see it's translating our one minus phi times old attraction plus phi times payoff. Okay, um, initial representation is being randomized. And this is for calculating the outcomes, standard deviation, yeah. And then that's it, you're running the simulation. Okay, so it is, uh, you should be able to see in this code the, the logic of the uh, four steps in the generic algorithm for doing an adaptive rationality model, right? You believe this, you start with some representation of the world, take action using softmax, get feedback from the real environment, update belief, repeat. And this model stops when you say enough time has passed. Okay, Samin, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, I just wonder whether I need to share this one or with this Python file with other. I think you can share it because I, if if at all, I mean, I, I would encourage you to also first do your own. So the way to use these these resources, don't directly jump to using the ones we give you. Okay, try and first build your own, and then compare it to the ones we have, and convince yourself you are getting the same results. And if not, then you should figure out why. Uh, with very high probability, you're doing something wrong. With some small probability, we are doing something wrong. Either case, we should know. But it's a good exercise to try and first replicate on your own. Okay, so try and do that. But once you are convinced that you understood what it is, my strong recommendation is use the same code libraries in the class. There's no reason why each of us has to have our own private way of defining a task environment or a learning rule, right? The rule is the same. So we can use these things like Lego and just build and mix and match again and again. Jangyo? Yeah, um, sorry, I, I was, was hoping to ask about the role that we used here, because it seems like the choice mechanisms, uh, what we discuss is different from what, what we have in this code, because what we discuss in is like choosing most uh, based on the probability of using the functions, but choice here is kind of rule based on some kind of random, uh, randomly choosing based on, you know, calculating the probabilities and if it exists, then it chooses. so it's kind of different. No, it's the same because remember the softmax equation is always written as the probability of picking any action is equal to this exponentiation of something plus the sum of the exponential of other things. So in the end, you get a probability. Yeah. How do I convert a probability into a choice? That's a rule A B. Mm -hmm. Right? If I give you a probability of something happening and I tell you, okay, this is the this is the PDF, this is the probability. Now tell me what action you'll actually take. The way to do it is to create a roulette wheel mm -hmm. where the probability of each action is mapped into the space the color occupies. Mm -hmm. And then you spin the wheel and then you pick that action. So you don't want it to be definitely taking the action K. You want it to be taken with a probability P which is coming out of this function. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this clear? If not, I want to make sure it is. This is a crucial point. 
right? Softmax yeah. is the function that gives you a probability, not a definite action. You still have to go through the step of picking the action with that probability, which means there mm -hmm. must be a probability you don't pick that action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood correctly because um, this code here, as far as I understand, this seems like adding up the probability from beginning from uh, zero. Not probability, like... adding up the attractions, adding up the attractions. Okay. Okay. Right, and then using that to create the ratio, so it, it should be adding up the attractions. Mm -hmm. Yes, it ah. says attraction, right? So it says math yeah. attraction. Yeah. So it's ah. adding up the attractions. In fact, what I can do is um, let me just reshare my screen. Mm -hmm. I should have in here a slide which talks about the pseudocode for soft packs. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, no, I don't have it here. It is for sure in the Tom Society meetings material. So there's a pseudocode given for softmax. And you'll see it's a two-step process, right? The first step process is calculating the attraction for each action and then exponentiating them and calculating this function. That just tells you the probability of picking an action. So given that probability, do I actually pick it or not, is going to be coming from the ruler. Right? So let's do a concrete example. Let's say there are two, only two actions. And I run it through softmax and it says the probability of action A is 80%. How do I go from that to whether I pick action A or not? So I take a roulette wheel and cover 80% of it with the color of A and 20% of it with the color of B. Then I spin the wheel. And if it lands in the red, then I pick A. Right? That's why we need both steps in there. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Amin. So yeah, please do share the code with everybody and they can use that as a starting point to start building stuff. Um, and then uh, let me do one last thing and then I think we can stop and see if there are any questions. So I think we've discussed this already, but I want to make sure it's, it's captured now in a formal place. So I'm going to steal some slides from my young friends, Julian and Helge. They're both former students of mine. They run a wonderful course in, um, in Munich every year on uh, modeling for organizational scientists. And this is a very nice summary comparing NK models to bandit models, okay? So as you can see, NK models are N choices, K interdependencies, bandit models are these N independent choices. So these are arms, right? So the N and the two is not the same. We already had the discussion. Um, I did not emphasize this point enough, but I now want to do it. The reason why I've always found the bandit models to be more useful for the work I do. I think it's worthwhile to share that. There are two reasons really. First, in the NK world, <clears throat> it's very easy to model interdependence between the individual choices, the zeros and ones. That's what creates the landscape, right? But how do you model interdependence between actors? This is not the same, right? Interdependence between actions is not the same as between actors, unless each action is taken by a different actor. So only in that special case where you have many actors and each actor only takes a binary flip of zero and one, modeling interdependence between actors can be actually quite hard in the NK world. Okay, there is a platform called NKCS which does it, but it's like horrendously complicated and never produces convergence. So it's a very difficult model. Basically what happens in those is the landscape you see is changing as a function of the actions of other actors. So each one has their own landscape and these landscapes are kind of dancing and deforming based on what actions actors are doing, okay? This is very complicated. I think we have a much more elegant and simple way of modeling interdependence between actions, which comes from game theory. So if you think about a game theory payoff matrix, that's a way of modeling interdependence between two actors because my payoff to an action depends on what the other is doing. That's interdependence, right? Each of these is basically an arm in a bandit. That's it. So we can always create interdependency matrices like this and simply treat each one as an arm in a bandit and then we are in business. So we can model interdependence between actors much more easily with this formalism. So this was one reason. This is why I started working with bandits. But over a period of time, I realized one of the big things with the NK is that there isn't really a way to capture the dynamics of beliefs. People don't maintain beliefs about the payoffs across the landscape. They, at any given point in time, only look at their local neighborhood, right? And in that local neighborhood, actually they maximize. 
They simply go with the best action in their local neighborhood, right? How do they discover what's the best action in the local neighborhood? So usually these models assume that there is a period of offline searching where the actors can somehow at low cost just sample in their one-step neighborhood and then they pick one, okay? But that action kind of sub suppresses completely the idea of how beliefs are formed, how they change over time and how they might diffuse in the system. So the NK is not a good model for belief dynamics. If you're interested in beliefs and how they spread among people or how they get updated, learning, the NK is not the right model. Okay, NK is a very good model for search, which is looking in different spaces in the landscape. But is it a good model of organizational learning? I'm not so sure. Okay, I think I've managed to convince Dan as well. So we've just recently finished a paper which is now coming out in Org Science, where we make this point that if you're interested in belief dynamics, uh, you should use something like a bandit formulation rather than an NK one, which took some persuasion as you can imagine, but we eventually got him there. Um, also the choice rule in NK is basically maximizing, right? There is no exploration in that sense. It's always picking the best action given your current beliefs. So this is another source of confusion often. People will talk about exploration in an NK model, but what they actually mean is distant search. You see that? So distant search in NK is not the same as exploration in Bandit. Sometimes people use the two terms synonymously. They're not the same thing. Distant search is the idea that instead of looking in one step neighborhood of where you are, you could jump to any part of the landscape. You can do a long jump. Exploration is given all the actions at the same time, you pick the action that is not necessarily the highest performing in your belief system. So another way to think about it is that you can think about uh, distant search in NK landscapes as a way of jumping in design space. So the space of designs and you do something completely random and arbitrary, that's like a long jump. Whereas in the bandit world, exploration is like risk taking. Okay. The problem of course, is you could say there's also risk taking in the long jump. You're right, there is, right? So it's not like a perfect separation between the two. But at least in the models, I think it's important to bear in mind that when people say exploration in NK, they really mean long jump. When people say exploration in Bandit, they mean doing something other than your current beliefs. Okay, and uh, analogically, they mean roughly the same thing, but the way they're implemented is different and therefore the interpretation is different as well. All right. So Fanish, yeah. in this... Oh. Go ahead, Pulkit. In the, yeah. Sorry. Put it first and then we'll talk. Yeah. So short jumps are essentially the greedy algorithms, right? And long jumps are completely some random play that you make in the Correct. NK model. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So the default in the NK model is the assumption of local search, which is fully greedy. So this is why I think it's really interesting that the, the way bounded rationality works in the NK is not in the choice rule. The choice rule is fully maximizing. Given your belief structure, this is what you do. And not only that, the belief structure is even accurate in your local neighborhood. So if you remember, I said there are four ways in which bounded rationality can manifest. It can be ignorance of the world, right? It can be changing goal structures. It can be non-greedy non action selection, right? And uh, there was one more. I can't remember what the fourth one was. But if you just think about these three for a second, neither NK nor Bandit typically allows for the goal structure to change. You're always worried about the same thing, making more payoff. But in the NK, conditional on where you are, your belief structure about your local neighborhood is 100% accurate. And conditional on that belief structure, your ability to pick the best one is 100% accurate. So it's a fully rationalizing agent, but in a local neighborhood. In Bandit, you have a global neighborhood with an adaptively rational agent who neither has full accuracy of beliefs nor is perfectly able to maximize. Okay, so very different models if you think about them. We can make them collapse through the tricks that I was talking about, but they were designed for different things. Okay, and therefore, when we interpret them across and, and within them, it's helpful to be aware of that. So, All right. And actually, exploration then it's not exploration, right? It's, it's just long search. It's long yeah. distance. Search. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's okay. why that's my point. So when people okay. use the word exploration in reference to NK models, I think they're being a little bit okay uh, ambiguous with the language. Let's put yeah. it. Yeah. Got, got it. Thanks. Okay. So of course, the NK is a very good model for certain things. So what it does really well, I think, is it represents complex combinatorial tasks. So where you're thinking of design or thinking of say formulating a strategy. And the, the problem you're trying to solve is the 
optimal policy or optimal strategy is a combination of many moving parts and the parts interact in complex ways, which you don't know how they interact. NK is perfect for that, right? But if your model is really between choice between known alternatives with unknown payoffs, which could be things like capital allocation, R&D and so on, then the bandit is the right model. Okay, so this is a good way to, to ask yourself, which path do I want to go down? Now, this is an academic point because in this class, I'm not covering NK. So for with, with me, you will have to go down the second path. But if you're interested in NK, I do think the, the piece that Machik put together on the Tom Society website is excellent. So a brilliant introduction. And, and Dan has a very nice uh, opening video, which talks about the history of the idea, where it comes from and so on. Okay. All right. I see some questions. Let's see who has them. So Shukti first and then Jangyu. Actually, Jangyu was waiting, I think. Why don't you go first? Oh, uh, okay. So I'll just make a very quick. Um, so I was wondering if NK is good for, uh, I, I understand your, that your point, NK is good for, good model for searching. And mm -hmm. was wondering if exploration can actually uh, be a way, method of uh, getting out of the local maximum. Is this, uh, is this the right explanation? Yes. So, so uh, just to be careful about the words we're using here, what is search and how is it different from learning? Okay, learning is an update in belief, which then leads to a change in behavior. So that's learning. Search is the addition of possible actions to your set of actions. So NK is the model of search because that's exactly what it does. By moving in this landscape, you're constantly changing the possible actions in your set because wherever you go, the possible actions are your local neighborhood. So by virtue of moving, you're constantly changing your set of possible actions. That's search. So NK is the perfect model if search is what you're interested in, okay? Now, because search is local and conditional on being local, you maximize, there's a huge risk of being trapped in local peaks, right? So those of you who remember taking the research methods class with me, remember I told you about the ant, which gets dropped on a smooth landscape, no problem, it will find the global peak. But an ant on a rugged landscape is gonna be trapped because if they look one step in any direction, it's all downhill, so they don't go anywhere. Except if the ant is not a maximizer. So think about that. So if I have an ant which looks one step in every direction, and instead of being the perfect rationalizing homo economicus ant or ant economicus, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's actually a, a, a noisy action selector. Uh -huh. So it looks in its neighborhood and it says, I should go here, where actually it should not have. Uh -huh. That can be useful, right? Because now you have fallen off a local peak. And you can start searching. Mm -hmm. So that is exactly the point where exploration, as we define it in the bandit, can meet the NK model and become a mechanism for escaping local peaks. Okay, that's okay. great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately for you, this idea is a fantastic one, but it's been done. So this is a paper by Thorbjorn Knudsen and Dan Levin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is exactly the core point in their paper. And they combine these two ideas there. So they bundle softmax into the NK uh -huh. and show that it can be a mechanism of escaping local peaks. Mm -hmm. but, okay. but I like the way you're thinking. This is exactly the way to think about recombination in this space of models. So in some sense, by the end of this course, what you should be doing is your own NK search on the landscape of models, right? You're trying to mix and match different combinations and see what, what comes out, what does not. But that's kind of the spirit of, of what we're trying to do here. Okay, uh, Hangjun? Yeah, Finish. I was just wondering, um... So in the two models, how is the, the adaptive, adaptive rationality uh, differently uh, you know, modeled? Can, can you explain? Yeah, so I want to actually go back to that slide where I defined it, so I remember all the four things. Here. So there are four ways in which rationality can be bounded, right? Compared to the global rationality model. Right. First is ignorance. So it's present in both. So in NK, the ignorance takes the form that at any given point of time, you don't know more than your local neighborhood. You don't know the payoffs of the rest of the landscape. It's kind of obvious, right? If you knew the entire landscape, you just go directly in one jump there. So you don't. So that's the fact that your representations are incomplete. In Bandit, the ignorance is captured by the fact that I know all the actions, but I don't know their payoffs. Right, that's ignorance. Okay, instability, not present in either model. 
at least in the basic versions of either model, agents are always still trying to maximize or increase their utility in some way. Now, obviously you can add this in. And one nice way to do this is to have agents which are super agents, by which I mean they're comprised of multiple agents. So imagine our committee, uh, our, our agent is actually a committee who take turns to take actions in every period, right? Which means they might have different preference functions. So over a period of time, they may end up taking very different actions because the utility functions are changing. So we could incorporate it, but it's not there in the basic model. So that is instability, which is not there in either. Third, satisficing, okay? Which is that we, we don't really revise our, our beliefs unless we are above some performance threshold or, or possibly not. Um, in the NK, the satisficing is hidden in the local search ID that I don't search globally. But there is no satisficing condition on local search. It's maximizing. You always take the best action, right? In the bandit, again, there's no explicit satisficing. It's implicitly there in the sense, if you look at your historical expectation of payoff for an action and treat that as your aspiration, you only revise your belief when there's a prediction error. Right? If prediction error was zero in those equations, like the ones we wrote earlier, they're gone now. If prediction error was zero, then regardless of what is fee, your beliefs don't change. So that's where satisficing is hiding inside the bandit framework. And finally, errors, which is the error in the choice. In NK, there is none, right? Because you maximally pick the best action in your local neighborhood, except in the extension we just discussed a minute ago, which Thought Gunnarsson and Dan have done. Whereas in the uh, bandit model, that's the tau. Oh, yeah. The tau in softmax is exactly picking up the error here. So these are the four ways in which rationality can be bounded. Three of them are present very explicitly in Bandit. Two of them are present in NK. And I think in both, there is this nice property that the one kind of boundedness can compensate for another. Right? The idea that if you have tau, which is a way of making noisy choices, it's a way of compensating for the fact that your beliefs are not accurate. So these two kinds of bounded rationality kind of cancel out. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think there was one more question. No, have I covered all? All right. So that's all I have. I think we have covered pretty much everything I want to do. You guys want to add anything, Sangyun or Hekin? Are we okay? Anish, will you be sharing the slides, please? Yes, I will share the slides. Thanks. I will share the slides. All right, in terms of what you need to do to get the most out of the class, I think um, there are kind of two tracks of work happening at different time scales. So by the, by the end of the course, I think it would be uh, certainly useful if you attempt a replication of one of the three papers I put up, right? And you don't have to replicate the whole paper. If you can get the first baseline result working, I think this is already pretty good. The rest are just details. Uh, one of the papers we actually discovered a couple of small errors in the text of the paper but I've corrected them. So they are now there in the, in the syllabus. If you go to the footnote, there are two places where there's a kind of a typo slash uh, embarrassing mistake <laughs> in the text, but not dramatic. It doesn't change anything really, but it does change the graph. But if you make those two corrections, then you should be fine. So over the course of the, the entire class, I think that's one thing you want to aim for as a group, replicate those papers, okay? Over the course of the entire class, I think it's also good if you can start thinking of one new idea that you want to develop as a group. This is optional, okay? I will not insist on it. But if you really want to become like even a sophisticated consumer, not a producer of these models, it's fun to try play with one of them. And we are trying to make it very easy for you by giving you the Lego building blocks, right? Literally mix and match. So I'm assuming now in NCR, you can't be in the PhD program if you're not already somewhat comfortable with coding and programming. So that was certainly my design principle when I was admitting, but I assume it's continuing. So in that case, all you need to do is know to patch these pieces together and you have a working model, right? So that, that you should be aiming for. More in the short term, for every week, I also have a follow-on reading. So for this week, the follow-on reading is on performance-based, um, uh, performance feedback-based learning, which is written by Henrik and Viva. So for next class, the immediate thing I would like you to do during this week is to try and represent the ideas in that chapter using the modeling framework we have introduced today. So how can I bring performance-based feedback ideas into the single agent adaptive rationality model that we've been discussing? That's the one week time duration assignment question. So it's a pretty work intensive class. There's going to be a lot of work both here and then offline. But uh, if you stick with it, I can guarantee you that there'll be no mysteries left 
in terms of reading and understanding these models and commenting on them or even producing your own. But beyond that, I think there is also a payoff in the, uh, in the clarity of understanding how these three apparently different literatures, right? The bandits and learning curve inspired literature. By the way, I didn't make that explicit, but hopefully you see the connection. Learning curves and bandits are really the same thing, right? Why do you get a declining learning curve? Just flip it around. It's an increasing performance over time. And we already have graphs like that, right? So if you look at these graphs, uh, here you go. Look at the first graph here. That's a learning curve. Okay, just flip it around. So instead of being performance, if you called it cost, it will be one minus performance, it will be the same thing. So the bandit is really a very nice way of understanding where learning curves come from. Okay, so you might want to do that thought experiment and ask on the shop floor when a worker is trying different ways to fix some widget, how is that like a bandit task? But it is because there are different ways to do it and we don't know which one is better till you try. So they keep trying and trying and exploring and exploiting and exploring and exploiting and eventually they get better and better and the costs go down, right? So there's that literature, there's the NK adaptation literature, and there's the performance feedback literature. And all three are about org learning in some very broad sense, but how to think about them in an integrated fashion and look for opportunities to synthesize or differentiate or innovate, that is partly the theoretical payoff of doing this class, right? So you'll be very clear about all of those different branches by the end of this. Okay, good, enough talking, let's talk for today. And I will hope to see you in a week from now, unless there are other burning questions. Uh, Sanish, is there, uh, when is the group presentation due or group, like group groups work due? Last session. So there's plenty of time. It's in April. So I think it's April 22nd or something. So there's a lot of time, right? And I haven't yet decided whether I would like you to present the replication. To be honest, I'm not so interested in seeing the replication. That's more for you. So if you guys end up doing like a, a new project or a new idea, that might be the one that you want to present in that final class. So I haven't really decided yet, which is better. Give me another week to sort that out. But assuming you work on both, you might show your own. In case you're not doing one of your own, but just replicating the model, maybe that's the one you show. Okay. All right, I think then that's it for now. Let me stop recording.